uh, again, round of applause. Last class with DJ TPL. Uh, how you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Uh, so we lot. I think a lot of things to do today. And by the way, uh, so DJ TPL's agent sent over uh, uh, his his glossies. Uh, so he's signing autographs if you want uh, with him afterwards. Okay. Uh, so we have enough for everyone. So this is it's a nice photo. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, your, your agent's very aggressive. It's like, he's got to sign autographs. I'm like, it's a class. It's kind of weird, <laughs> but whatever. All right. Yeah. Uh, all right, guys. A um, lot to cover, so let, let's finish up. So for uh, the, the major thing on the docket for you guys, other than the final exam, again, is uh, Project 4. It's going to be due this Monday at midnight, and then we're having the extra office hours on Saturday uh, on, on the fourth floor in, in Gates. Okay? Who here has not started Project 4? Really? Bold. Okay. Uh, that's not a good idea. Okay. Um, are there any high level questions about Project 4? Yes. You, yes, you can use late day as Project 4. Yes. Um, we, we set the due date because the university policy is that we're not supposed to have anything due during the finals week. I, I did it one year and I got in trouble. So, yeah. Are there any other questions? Yes. His statement is, is Project 4 going to be used in previous semesters? Because it's, it's the most time consuming of all the projects we've done so far. Yeah, we were, we were uh, the plan is yes, we probably will use it in, 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 in subsequent semesters. Uh, we try to dial down, down the complexity quite a bit. This is sort of why we give you the tests ahead of time, why we said, OK, here's all this extra bonus stuff you could do if you wanted to. Uh, but like, we'll see how it goes, and we, we will adjust accordingly. Yes? That, that'll be later, at the, at the end. I didn't forget. There's slides on that. There's some, th some things you brought on the piazza you wanted me to discuss, and that we'll discuss that at the end. All right, the question about Project 4. All right, cool. Um, so, again, reminder, and we'll, we'll post this on the piazza again. Uh, if you like databases a lot, you like this class, uh, or you think bus stop is terrible and you want to rewrite a lot of it, uh, Jignesh is teaching this next semester in the spring. So if, if you're going to be around and you want to be TA, by all means, please sign up. And again, you don't have to be like Chi. Chi is uh, violating labor laws sometimes, <laughs> and we don't want to do that. Uh, so, so don't. So I've had two people come to me like, "Yeah, I want to be a TA, but am I gonna, do I have to be like Chi?" And the answer is no. Okay, the kid's a freak. He might be on cocaine, well, <laughs> but he's graduating. All right. All right. Any questions about this? All right. So the other thing, too, also we'll post this on Piazza. Your feedback is strongly needed. So the point he just brought up, hey, Project 4 is way too hard relative to the other projects. Uh, it used to be Project 2 was too hard. And then we try to, try to rebalance things. So we, take, we, we do listen to the feedback, uh, and we want your opinion about everything. Now, for undergrads, I don't need to explain to you what it's like to write course feedback. It's for the master students. You guys are terrible. Uh, I'm not saying you, anybody in particular, but every year the master students are like, this class is great, this class is great, this class is great. Whereas the undergrads go in very details uh, and a lot of details about what things are wrong and what we can do better. So if you're a master student, please like, be brutal. It's anonymous. I can't see it. Uh, we don't see names. So by all means, if, things are, if you want to do things better, let us know. Okay? And again, if you're not graduating, come, you know, come make suggestions in the, in the course feedback and then come in the spring and be a TA and fix things for future people. Um, for office hours leading up to the, the final exam, I'm moving mine to be on Monday at 9.30 in the morning uh, over Zoom. Jignesh is actually with his wife right now, so he's not going to be on campus uh, for the rest of the semester. So his office hours will also be at noon, or sorry, over Zoom. Uh, if you want to meet with me beyond these hours, please send an email, and I will try to accommodate you. Okay? And then the TAs will hold the regular office hours up to and including this Friday. They will have the Project 4 office hours on, uh, on, on Saturday. And then there won't be any office hours from the TAs starting next week. OK? All right, so the final exam. Who has to take it? Anyone enroll, anyone enroll in the class? Uh, it's going to be in Posner 153. I'll explain what, how this is going to work yet. We actually have three locations. Uh, we'll see how we're going to divvy that up. That'll be on next Tuesday, 8.30 AM. Uh, and go watch that, that video to understand why. If you need a special accommodation, some of you have already done this. If you haven't yet, please do this. Uh, as soon as possible, so that way we have time to prepare and work with the disability office. And then the, the, I'll post this on Piazza after the class, but the, the, the final guide for the, um, for, the, for the exam and the practice exam will, is available on the website now. All right, so if you ever look, if you looked at the, uh, the, 
the, the CMU schedule for the final exams, we're actually assigned three classrooms. Uh, we're in Posner and then the Hall of Arts and then two different rooms. So I want everyone to show up at Posner 153, which is the big building, uh, they're, sorry, the big room, show up there. We will then assign you to a random location so that we can spread out. Posner is the bigger one. Most, most of you guys will be in there, but it'll, we'll just randomly spread out across the different rooms that are close to each other. And there'll be two TAs in every single room. And then myself, uh, I'll be bouncing around, asking questions and helping as, as we go along. Okay? So again, everyone show up to Posner 153, and then we'll figure out uh, where do you go after that. The rooms are, as far as I know, they're, they're, they're close to each other. Okay? All right, so what to bring? Obviously, we need your CMU ID. Bring a pencil and an eraser. You can take the exam in a pen if you want to, but then you're going to scratch things out, and, and it's going to be a huge pain for us uh, to deal with. So please bring a pencil. Please bring an eraser. Uh, you may need a calculator. Uh, using your cell phone is sufficient because most people don't have standalone calculators. Um, and then you can bring one sheet of notes, double-sided, uh, and they have to be handwritten, just like you had in the midterm exam. Um, one, one year, a kid was hawking HF, HFT-themed clothing. This is two years ago uh, when that was a thing. It, it, actually, I, I take that. I don't care if you want to. If you waste your money on NFT clothing, that's, that's your problem. Okay? Uh, but you can bring food. We'll have coffee and, and donuts for everyone as well early in the morning. All right? All right, so what will be on the exam in terms of everything that was before the midterm? Obviously, you need to know SQL. Uh, you know, if, if you've forgotten SQL at this point after homework one and other things, uh, then you have other problems. Uh, but everyone should have basic understanding of SQL. So if we show you a SQL query, you understand what it's doing. Uh, you obviously need to know what the buffer manager is doing because in the context of you know, logging recovery, how do you know when things are allowed to be written out the disk? Um, you need to understand basic data structures, hash trees, B plus trees, when to use one versus the other. The storage models, column storage versus row stores, you know, how much data is going to get moved around, uh, potentially if it's in a distributed environment. Query processing models, you know, what, what are the actual operators themselves when, when they're pushing or pulling data up? Uh, are they sending batches, vectors, or the entire uh, uh, result set? And then basic interquery parallelism. Like there's an exchange operator you would use to co combine things. Sorry, that's interquery. Uh, interquery parallelism means multiple queries ru running at the same time. And what are the implications of that? All right, so there's the basic high-level information you need to know from before the midterm. For the things that we did cover uh, from midterm going forward, uh, we, you need to understand basics about query optimization. We obviously only had one lecture on this, and it's a very complicated topic, uh, so we can't go into too much detail. But it's basic information about what are the implications of doing predicate pushdown in the query plan or projection pushdown, or how, do you, how can you rewrite a subquery to pull things out and execute it as a join. Okay, we're obviously not going to ask you to you know, derive an algorithm that, do that, that does that because that's hard, uh, but at a high level, what does that actually look like? We talked about basic information about collecting statistics, cardinality estimations, histograms. Again, we can't obviously go into too much detail, but again, understanding this at a high level. And then what are the implications of something using a cost-based search? Like how would that plug in with one of these cost models to determine like the correct join order, for example? And then you can see how you could fuse this uh, or synthesize this, this, this knowledge with the distributed databases later on to understand, oh, the cost model would have to include moving data across the network, right? So again, high-level things like this, not specific formulas. We spent a lot of time talking about transactions. Uh, so the first sort of set of lectures, were, or the first lecture was on again, what we'll call the theory of transactions or concurrency control. Like, what does it mean for a database system to say it's, it provides ACID guarantees, atomicity, consistency, isolation, and uh, durability? And again, when it was a single node, consistency didn't quite make sense. It makes more sense in a distributed environment. Um, but certainly, atomicity, isolation, and durability mattered a lot on, on a single node. Then we spent time talking about conflict serializability and view serializability. Again, high-level uh, concepts and ideas, not necessarily the protocols you would use to, to, to support them. That, that comes later. Um, so how would you determine whether a schedule is, is correct, is conflict serializable? And how could you determine whether two different schedules are conflict equivalent? And then view serializability, the main thing is understanding what is the difference of view serializability in terms of what the application sees uh, with, you know, in terms of correctness and the ordering of operations in a schedule relative to conflict serializability. Right? In the case of like, view serializability, it was about the, you could reorder things and you still ended up, the, the client still ended up seeing the, the, the same result. Right? And again, no system implements view serializability because you need to understand what does correct mean to the application. And that's not something any database system can, can reason about now. We talked about recoverable schedules. And then we talked about isolation levels and, and, and anomalies. 
right? What's the, what's the lowest isolation level in the NC standard? Read uncommitted. What's the highest? Serializable, yes. Is there anything above serializable? Strict, Strict serializable, yes, good. Excellent. Right? Again, like, there's no form of these to understand what, like, what are the anomalies you could, you could have, right? The phantoms, the dirty reads, the in, uh, unrepeatable reads, right? Understanding all those, those things in the context of, of concurrency control. And then for specific protocols, we spent a lot of time talking about two-phase locking, right? The difference between rigorous and non-rigorous, or strict versus non-strict. Um, we talked about the cascading aborts problem. Right? If, somebody re if a transaction reads data that was uncommitted from another transaction, and that other transaction aborts, you've got to roll everyone back in the cascades. We talked about the different uh, methods to handle deadlocks, which is the big problem you have in two-phase locking. Right? How do you detect it? Well, the weights for the graph and determine who to kill. And then deadlock prevention was wound or wait, wait and die, trying to figure out some kind of ordering mechanism based on transaction IDs or timestamps of transactions to determine who to kill to, to, to avoid a deadlock or kill yourself early or kill somebody else. And then we talk about hierarchical locking or multiple, multiple granularity locking. And this is where we introduced intention locks. So as you're traversing down this, this hierarchy of the database system, right, there's a database, you could have a table, table has pages, and so forth. Right, you can take intention locks in those higher levels to, to give hints to other transactions that come along about what you may be doing in those lower, uh, lower levels. And the key thing here is understanding the performance trade-offs of allowing for more parallelism by taking as, as, as uh, the, the, the minimum permission locks as you need at the lowest point in, the, in, the, in this tree versus having to go to the lock manager over and over again to say, I have this lock. Like, there's a whole, there's whole, you know, that has to be concurrent data structure in itself. And then lock escalation would be, if I hold a lock in this mode, can I take a lock in another mode? When is that allowed? Yes? The question is, do you need it to memorize the intention lock grid? I mean, if, if that helps you understand it, but like the, if you understand what, like, you know, we're shared intention, shared intention exclusive, you don't understand what they are. Yeah. Yes? Can you go over the performance trade-offs again? This question is, can I go over the performance trade-offs? So the, the, there's this trade-off between how much parallelism I have, I want to have, allowing other transactions to run at the same time and, and take, take compatible locks on different parts of the database system versus having to go to the lock manager and make a request that I want to acquire these locks, right? So an example would be if I have a table and a table has a billion tuples and I want to update all one billion of them, I could take a exclusive lock on the entire table and then that blocks anybody else from doing anything below, below in the tree, but, then I, I, but I only have to go to the lock manager once. Or I could go down, take you know, an intentional exclusive lock on the, the, the table and then take exclusive locks on the individual tuples I want to update but now I got to go to the lock manager every single time I, I need to acquire those locks, right? That again, big picture. There isn't, there's not math involved in determining that. Just understand the pros and cons of both of them. Yes. What specifically do you mean by lock escalation? Because I think it was mentioned in lecture, but it wasn't really gone into depth. This question is, what do I mean by lock escalation? It'd be if I hold, in which cases, for what, if I hold a lock in what mode, uh, can I escalate it to a higher mode, and when is that allowed? So to obviously, give away, like, say ignore intention locks. I hold a shared lock. Can I escalate to a, automatically to an exclusive lock? No, because you don't know who else may be holding the shared lock. Now, if nobody else holds the shared lock, which you would know because you have a lock manager, then you could do that. High level details. We're not at, there's no formulas here. Yes. Uh, this question, when, when would you try to upgrade locks? If, again, don't think of like a, a single query coming in and acquiring locks and, and walking away. Think of a multi-query transaction. I do a select on something, the application gets the result, then it comes back and does an update. Right, so then I, I, I and I, you know, if I'm doing, uh, if I'm doing the, the rigorous uh, two-phase locking, I hold the lock until the very end. So can I go back on the second query and, and escalate that shared lock into an exclusive lock, right? Um, and then we talked about like hints. You can do select for update. You, so you can do a select query and say, oh, by the way, I'm going to update immediately afterwards. So take, don't take share locks. Take exclusive locks on the objects I read. So then when the, when the update query comes, it already holds an exclusive mode. All right. But again, that, that's a low-level detail we don't have to worry about. All right. So after today's locking, we talked about timestamp ordering protocols or optimistic pro protocols. 
Uh, we talked about the basic time save ordering, concurrent control. We talked about this one optimization, the Thomas Wright rule. Uh, it allows you to, to write things, uh, to, to overwrite, to, to write objects to objects, uh, even though they've been updated in the future and you just ignore them. Um, we talked about doing OCC, creating the three phases, the read phase, validation phase, and write phase. And should, this will look very similar to what you'll see, what you did in the homework. And I think we have a question on this on the practice exam as well. And then we spent time talking about multi-version concurrent control. And I'm not so much worried about like how do you fit in OCC or 2PL in MVCC. It was really the different design decisions you would have in a database system. If you want to support multi-versioning, uh, you know, how would you actually organize those versions in storage? Do you order the newest to oldest, oldest to newest? How do you do garbage collection to clean up old versions? Uh, and then how do you maintain indexes, which may have uh, pointers to different versions? Yes. Yeah, one thing I want to make clear up is uh, concurrency control, the optimistic control, is kind of an alternative or an, uh, to two PL, isn't it? Or do you use that in conjunction? The state. His question is: Is is OCC an alternative to two PL? Yes. Okay. So most every non-academic system. Let me think of this. Yeah, pretty much every system. There are some academic prototypes that kind of blend them. Like if you know if you know your low contention, OCC will be better, and then maybe if you add more contention, you, it'll automatically switch to 2PL. But like it's so hard. I mean, you guys have seen this in Project Four. It's so hard to just implement one of them. Nobody implements two and tries to be tries to be clever like that. You, everyone just picks one. Okay, uh, we took time talking about crash recovery. Uh, so this is about and if, if I have a bunch of changes sitting in memory. Uh, when can the buffer pool flush them out, right? And there's, there's sort of two to nine decisions we, is whether to do steal, no steal, or force, or no force. Again, steal is when the, the data system is allowed to flush out pages that have been modified by transactions that have not committed yet uh, in order to make room for, for other things you need. And no steal says you can't do that. Like you can only flush out data when it's been committed. Uh, and then force is, force versus no force is the requirement that I have to flush all the dirty changes from a transaction immediately when it commits, before I can tell the outside world that it committed, uh, or can I do this, can I defer it to some later point? So the right ahead logging scheme that we talked about was what? Was steal versus no steal? Most data systems are gonna implement steal, yes, right? Because otherwise, if I, have, if, I, if I have to update more data that can fit in memory, I, I can never do it, right? And are they force versus no force? No force, right, because I can, I can defer the change I put my right ahead log. Here's the changes. Here's the, the changes I mod. Or here's the, the, the modification I made to the data system. That has to get persisted. So then, if there's a crash, you can replay that log and recreate the, what was in the buffer pool. We talked a little bit about, about logging schemes. And again, I'm not. The distinction between phys, physical and physiological is not what we're really worried about. It's really physical or versus logical, right? The idea that I do. I, am I updating? In my log, my log records are going to be here's like the deltas of the changes I made to individual records or tuples in, in my data, my database, or is it the query that I executed, right? And then what are the trade-offs of the two of them? Like if it's if it's physical, yeah, I may may end up storing a lot more data. Like my query may update a billion tuples, and therefore I have to have a billion log records for all those one billion updates. Uh, and then when I recover, I you know I just have to replay all those. And logical would be just here's the here's the single update query. Question yes. His question is, in the, in the homework, there was something about no steal, a right head logging using no steal and, and force. Uh, is that just shadow paging? Uh, more or less, yes. With shadow paging, like the, because you're writing to the shadow files, it doesn't matter rather as, you, as your things get flushed, like while you're still running. Like no, no, no other transaction can see them. But again, very few systems do that. All right, we talked about checkpoints, like fuzzy checkpoints versus like stop the world checkpoints. And then we spend time talking about Aries. Again, it's understanding the three phases, analyze, redo, and undo. All right, what, what happens to the database system when, when it makes those changes? What, how does it update the internal state or the, the metadata that it's, being, that it's using to keep track of here's the changes that are being made? How do the log sequence numbers or LSNs fit into the protocol? And how do the compensation log records, how are they being used to make sure that if I crash, the system crashes during recovery, I can recover from my, my recovery. 
All right, and then lastly, we talked about distributed databases. And again, because there wasn't a project based on this, and it was sort of a, a sort of high-level overview of the different topics in the space, right? We can't really ask you deep questions about like how would you actually implement this thing and that thing. All right, it's more about what are the different system architectures, and primarily the difference between shared disk and shared memory. What are the pros and cons, or what are the trade-offs of, of these different designs? Uh, how can a database system replicate its data across different uh, nodes to make sure that it's, it's always available or can recover if a machine dies? The different implications of the different partitioning schemes. Again, like if I have a range partitioning, I can do range queries. If I hash partitioning, I can maybe only do point queries. And then basic information, like as we asked you in the homework about two phase commit. All right, any questions about any of this? Yes. Uh, his question is when the homework grades will be released, be released. We will do that this week. Yes. It, it, probably today. Yes. Is Paxos The question is Paxos on there. I mean, not real. I mean, if you, again, we, we, we would not show you, like, hey, you know, high level questions, like two phase commit is enough. If you understand two phase commit at a high level, you would understand Paxos. The difference is that Paxos is a quorum, two phase commit is everyone has to agree. Other questions? All right, so what's not on the exam? Obviously, single store. Uh, and then this has come up in previous years where, because uh, you know, myself and Dignesh, when, when we lecture, we like to say, oh, MySQL does this, or Postgres does this, or whatever. Right? All that is obviously we're not going to ask about. It. That's just color commentary for, uh, for your own edification to understand how the, th the concepts we talk about during the semester map to real world systems. OK? All right, final exam, Tuesday, 8.30 AM. Come to Posner 153. And the, the practice exam is, is posted on the website. We'll post the link on Piazza, the files on Piazza uh, after this class. Um, and then office hours with the gen next to myself on, on Monday. OK? So does today's lecture count as a detailed report? Uh, his question is, do, do, like, will, this, will today's lecture be in the exam? Yep. No. Okay. This, is, this is Andy just ranting about databases. It's not. Uh, if the whole actually, you were saying the PL class is basically them ranting about why he hates other programming languages. I I like to think I'm getting it's more than this, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So um, no, if if any Andy rants are not on the exam. Um, other questions? All right, so let's get to the fun stuff. Um, so. I don't. I don't. I didn't, I didn't make a graph of this because of, of the, what people voted for. Uh, there was one system that got the most votes. Uh, we'll come to that in a, in a second. Um, most of this, I realized also too. I probably, in retrospect, I probably should have said, "Here's the systems you could choose from," just because the votes were all over the place. Like everyone, the, most systems got one vote. Uh, the the first system we're going to cover got the most votes. That was the, the non-joke system. So if you know what the joke system was, everyone probably everyone voted for that. Uh, but this one got the most votes. And then the other two, there was other ones that were also tied in sort of second and third place. But I'm recovering the ones that, uh, that I, I could put together slides quickly for. Um, so the first one's going to be Redis. This, this one got the most votes. Uh, so who, who, who here has actually used Redis? Ah, a lot. OK, decent. Who here has actually writ written a clone of Redis? Nobody. Uh, you laugh. That's a, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of clones of this. Um, all right. so. Redis is considered the canonical NoSQL data system, like along with Mongo. They sort of came out in the same era. Uh, so it came out in 2009 by this Italian guy. Uh, he wrote a lot of it himself. And so Redis stands for Remote Dictionary Server. So at its core, Redis is a uh, single node key value database system written in C. And what's interesting about it is that it, 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 it it's designed to be as fast, you know, do, do key value operations as fast as possible. So it has a single threaded execution engine. And all the data resides entirely in memory. So the first thing, so let's take the in-memory stuff first. So, you know, this entire semester has been about disk-oriented database systems. So you have to have a buffer pool, and you bring pages in from, from, from memory into, from disk into memory. And then there's a page table. You keep track of where things are actually being located, right? All of that requires additional internal latching to make sure that the data structure of the page table and all the other things that's, that's inside the buffer pool are thread safe. Right? But, but there's overhead to that. And so it, in, traditionally, if your disk is slow, which it, historically it always has been, then you're OK with taking, paying the penalty of taking those latches in memory because 
going to disk is so expensive anyway, right? It's, it's, a, it's not the high pull in the tent. And so if, but now if you say my entire database is going to be in memory, there is no buffer pool. Everything I could ever need, any page or any record I want, is always in memory. Then the cost of acquiring those, those, those latches starts to add up, and that becomes the, the more, becomes the bottleneck. So in Redis, they say, well, we're not going to do any of that. We're, we're just, the, the engine itself is going to be single-threaded. I mean, there's only one reader, and there's only one, you know, only, only one thread could actually be doing anything in the database at, at a time. So therefore, I don't need those latches. I don't need any internal data structures to keep track of things. Uh, I basically can almost run as bare metal speed. So this is why Redis is, is historically been known as one, you know, one of the faster database systems. Um, so what's also interesting about Redis is that beyond just being, you know, there's a bunch of other key value stores that are out there, but what they do, that, which is interesting, is that they actually have specialized value types. Right? So, so when I say a, a sort of generic key value store would be, here's my key and here's my value, and the value is just a blob, right? uh, some, some byte stream. The data center doesn't know anything about what's inside of it. And so anytime you want to interpret what's in that byte stream, you got to do this in application code. So in Redis, their values could be either strings or hashes or integers or lists or sets. And then they have specific commands that can do manipulation on those data structures within, within, within a single you know, round trip update. Instead of having to bring stuff in the application, modify stuff, and, and then push it back out. So that part is interesting. That, that part is... is uh, other than all, there was a bunch of clones of Redis, but that, that, I think that part of Redis was novel when it came out. So because it's in memory, and we'll talk in a second about how they handle, uh, make sure that their data is persistent. Um, in the real world, I come across Redis being primarily used as a cache, um, right? So you would have your regular database system, MySQL, Postgres, Mongo, whatever you want. And then you would have this cache, this, this cache on the side, uh, the sidecar cache. And then your application would say, oh, I need to get this key. Instead of going to the database system and running the query, I'll go check Redis. If it's there, great, I'll just use that. If not, then I'll go to the database system. Right? It's a way to avoid having to do a bunch of additional operations on the database system, which would be expensive to do. So I was joking before, I asked him why anybody has written a clone, because there's, there's a ton of these like, hobby projects that are out there where people like, you know, they have lettuce, because it's, it's, you know, or well, whatever programming language you can think of, Take the first letter of that programming language, and there and there'll be a Redis clone. Like there's Jettis, and like there's there's with the J or G for Go or Java, right? There's a bunch of these clones of them. Um, these are these KDB and Dragonfly. They're probably the two most developed. Oh, Tennis out of Tenset as well. Um, these probably are the two most well developed uh, extensions or rewrites of of, of Redis. Actually, KDB, KDB was Canadian. They got bought by um, what's the other? Not Instagram. What's the other uh, social media where they take photos with the ghost? Snapchat. Snapchat. Yeah, they go out by Snapchat. Oh, all they did is put, they fucking put a latch in front of it, right? So they say that they can do. So instead of being single-threaded, it's multi-threaded. But they just put a latch, right? And they got acquired for that. Um, Dragonfly is a complete rewrite. Tendus is ten cent. I think it's open source. I don't know whether they forked it or not. But there's a again, if you go to DBDIO, if you go click the compatibility with Redis, there's a ton of these systems, um, and I, there's a bunch of them I, I don't even put on. And there's some. Uh, there's some company where they'll sell you basically a, a course like 445 where you basically learn how to write your own Redis clone. Yes? Uh, how does it handle variable length type thing as well as just variable length? Like, is there a layer of pointer direction? Is there some slotted key? So how does it handle what, sorry? Uh, variable length. If, if it's what, sorry? If, if what? Like, like the strings and the hashes are all variable length. Yeah. So how does it handle those things? It's a hash table. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it literally, just, like, it's just an in-memory chain hash table. Oh, okay. Yeah. We'll get that in a second. All right. Yes? So like they would have, yeah, they had a global latch in front of the data structure. Because uh -huh. my student looked at this. It's a global latch in front of the data structure. So you can have multiple, multiple updates come in, right? But then it's still, there's still a latch in front of the data structure. But then that's not concurrent. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, it's concurrent network connections. Is that at least a read write latch? Uh, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. Huh? Well, at least multiple reads? They might allow multiple reads, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so here's what keys look like, right? It's just, they're just like strings, and they have you know, different uh, nomenclatures to just correspond to, like, is it a, ha like, well, here's a, if you want a sorted set, a hash table, you can get a list, a set, and then there's regular strings being stored in there, right? And then the other side here, these are just values. We'll, we can give a quick demo of what this looks like. Um, and so Redis, by default, doesn't support SQL, 
Um, there is, there was a Redis SQL. There was like, again, there's people that take Redis and they put SQL stuff on top of it. Uh, they put graph APIs on top of it. Um, the, the Italian guy that originally started writing Redis, he no longer works on the project. I don't know what, I don't know what he's doing now. And then there's a, there was a company that was doing hosted Redis called Redis Labs. I think they bought the Redis name and, started, and now they're just called Redis the company and they're trying to commercialize Redis. And what they're basically trying to do is go beyond the, or sort of, break the mindshare thought or the, the perception that Redis is only used as a cache and they're trying to build a bunch of APIs in front of it so you could use it as your primary storage database. And it remains to be seen how successful they will be. So again, it doesn't support SQL. So instead you get a bunch of just these commands that do very specific operations on uh, the different data types, right? Uh, and so in your application code, you have to be able to specify or know, like I'm doing you know, I'm, do, I'm operating on a key that looks of this type, and therefore I can only run these commands. Otherwise, it, it will throw an error. Um, again, I only learned Redis last night, so let's see how it goes. Um, let's see. Uh, it's materialized, sorry. You want to go to eight. Right, so. Uh, you can do simple things like set. This is a command line interface, so it has a nice, uh, like, you know, suggestion. So do a key called, you know, class, and then we'll put ABC in, right? So now if I call get ABC, nope, nope, sorry, get key class, right? I get that back. Um, then you can do other things, like you can do... Me, this is me trying to figure it out. Right, so they have incremental, they have increments. So you can define like a, um, you can divide, basically define a counter, right? Let me get rid of this over here. So I can say increment and then we'll give it a counter. We'll call it counter X, right? And every time I call that command, it'll automatically just add one to it. Right, so think of like it's a game. You're keeping track of scores or something. You do things like that. What's kind of funky is that you can put a number in front of this and say, "I want to increment it five times." Right? Um, if I call get, I should be able to get the current value counter x. Right? But what's interesting here, I, I'm assuming here that they're returning back, "Hey, the type is an integer." When I call increment, but when I call get, I get the response back as, as a string. Right, so I think they're storing everything as strings, and then no, I can't. I can't. Actually, I, sorry, I take it back. The wire protocol sends everything back as a string, uh, in and out as a string. They must be doing something here to cast it or store it natively as as integer on the server side. But I, I haven't looked at the source code to, to figure that out. Um, but let's make a list now. So get key. Scan the All right, yeah, so here, we'll make a list. We'll call it list X. Right? And then I can add something else. So, all right, so when I was doing this last night, okay, great, I got a list. Give me back the list. So, so I thought, okay, I'll do list X. Doesn't like that, right? Because it knows that it's a list, and I'm asking for a command that's not on, that's for, for, for like basic key value pairs and not list. So this is actually goes back to something I said at the very, very beginning about uh, why SQL and relational models are a good idea, and that there was earlier systems that had these APIs where based on the type or the value you were storing, you had one set of commands versus another set of commands. To me, it seems perfectly reasonable to be able to say, hey, get me that list. But no, you can't do that. It doesn't let you to do that, right? Because it's not storing any, potentially any information on the server side about what the type actually is, so it's relying on you, the application, to know what command you should call it on. You should call it on a different data type, right? So like, if now I do this, let's see, let's see if it'll let me do this. What if I call list x now, you know, one, two, three. Let me do that. But now I can call, now I get it back, right? The database doesn't let me do that. And so that means if someone makes a mistake in your application code and doesn't know that it's calling you know, calling certain commands based on a uh, on a list type versus a regular type, you might 
you might break your you know break your database and ruin your data. So this is a, to me this is a great example when, of like why schemas and why the relational model is a good idea because your Postgres MySQL won't let you do that. And furthermore, it's it's a, you just write select and you don't care in your in your query what the data type actually is. You just say just give me these results and get it back. Now yeah, there's certain functions you could call that you have to know what type it is and it maybe the system tries to do type inference and other things and cast stuff, but to me, that seems bizarre that I can't call get on a list, right? To me, that seems wrong. So then the way you get it back, I think it took a while to figure this out. Um, yeah, here. The way you get it back was you have to call this L range, so it's a list range, and I went from zero, and then it's like the Python syntax where like negative one is the, the last item in the list. Right, well, then, yeah, see, like I broke it. So now I gotta go back. All right, can't do that. So make, it, make a new list. Um, list y, and then now. I missed the example. Yep, 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 thank you. This again, this is why I use my laptop to type instead of this. Right? Then I get the list back. Right? So that's. Yes? Yes. Firstly, um, the page will support a secret type syntax on this. Uh, which will be somewhat similar to how Bluster does it. You have a query analyzer and optimizer and everything. Wouldn't that sort of add more overhead if you want something very fast to be used by this? So. The statement is, if I add, if I'm adding SQL and, and, and the relational model on top of the, the system, like we have in BusTop or other systems, wouldn't this be... Uh, wouldn't that slow things down because you have to parse the query and all that stuff? Absolutely, yes. So for like simple things, like a key value store for a cache, sure, that's fine. But if you to use this as your primary database and not have something enforce your schema uh, to protect you from shooting yourself in the foot like I did just now, that's a, that's a recipe for disaster. You'll, it'll, get, it'll help you get stuff up and running very quickly, but like think of like five years from now, 10 years from now, you know, you're dead or whatever, or like you've been fired and you're not working the application anymore, somebody else is picking up your code and now got, they got to deal with your clusterfuck, right? So having things that, that prevent humans from doing stupid things for a primary storage database is, is, is a good idea. For a cache, like if the, if the key is just a session ID and you get back JSON or whatever, that's fine. I don't care. Yes. Yeah, so his question is, um, I'm saying Redis is a cache, but there's another famous cache, uh, distributed cache called Memcached uh, that came out of LiveJournal, if you know what that, think of like, before Tumblr, if you know what Tumblr was, uh, before Medium, right, so there's Medium now, or, or Substack, and then there was, there was Tumblr was a hot thing, and then before that was LiveJournal. It still exists, I think it's for the furries or whatever. Um, the, they built this distributed cache called memcached, and it is a distributed, it's a consistent hashing, uh, hash table that does to basically get and sets. So what memcached, as far as I know, they only support get, set, and deletes. Redis has all these, I showed the commands, has all these other uh, detailed commands you could do on different data types. I think that's, that's why this would be different. Now the question is, can you make Redis distributed? Yes, there is a distributed version of, of Redis. Uh, I don't know whether it's a, it's a middleware on the front or whether, like, the, the you can you can read and write to any node. I don't, I don't know how it works. Yep. Yes. Uh, you mentioned Redis can be used as an in-memory cache to um, to cache something that's another database database system. Yes. Uh, so whose responsibility is it in this case to maintain consistency between all those? So his, his question is, in my scenario where I said you had a Redis as a cache and then Postgres or whatever database as the primary storage, who's responsible for maintaining the cache? The application code. Right, so it, it's a it's a sidecar cache, not a write through cache, right? So a write through cache would be like sits in front of the database system. I do a write, and then it gets propagated to the database system. Redis doesn't support SQL; it doesn't support any of that. So in the application code, you're responsible for doing that. Yeah. So that means, of course, again, if you now do an update and something gets invalidated, you have, then you have to send a delete request to the cache. Yes. Is that that they are providing consistent? Like, doesn't that make it so it's much better? His question is, uh, I'm saying that they're providing some kind of level of persistence. 
Does that, does that mean single-threaded is a bad idea? So not necessarily. So if you're only doing, uh, if you're only getting like a single key at a time or getting data that's always going to be within the same partition, then what you could do with Redis, and other systems do this similar approach, like my PhD thesis was, was, was on this approach, um, you could have every core just run a whole instance of the database server. And they don't, they don't need to talk to each other because everything's going to be within that single, single system and, and it's single threaded. So then now something up above has to decide, OK, I need to get this data. You could hash it and then decide which core you want to then talk to. So you could scale out Reddish because, because they're, the transactions don't need to talk to each other, don't need to talk to different partitions. You can scale this out very easily. But something above it needs, needs to handle it. And I, and I think the Redis, the commercial company, has something that does that. It's when you have to tar start talking to, if you want in a transactional, like in a transaction consistent manner, I need to get data at two partitions, then that's where things become problematic. Because then it's a, it's a distributed transaction like we talked about before. Because you got to coordinate across, across each instance. All right, so if it's in memory, in my, um, my demo here, if I shut the system off, turn it back on, it, it gets wiped out every single time because everything is in memory. So the way they handle uh, to, to make things that are persistent and durable is that they use a write-ahead log for, to keep track of individual updates. And that literally is writing out the command that gets sent over the wire. Like when I typed in the console, they literally take that string and they write it to a file. It's logical logging. Because then when, when you load back up, then they, then they replay the, the, the log as if it was coming over the wire. But what they do to handle uh, checkpoints or snapshots is that they basically have a background cron job by default, I think 60 seconds. Every 60 seconds, they're going to fork the process. What happens in OS when you fork the process in memory? What's that? Copy on write, right? So you're going to fork the process, and now you have a consistent snapshot of, the, of what was in memory at the time that the process got forked in the child process. The parent process can keep, keep processing updates and making modifications to in memory. Then the OS does the copy on write, updates and makes new pages in memory. And so the, the, the child process doesn't see any of those updates. And because it's single threaded, you know that there's no in-flight transactions while you're running. So it ha again, it has a consistent view of the database. And then that other, that, that child process just takes whatever's in memory and writes it out to disk as a checkpoint. So it's a clever trick to reduce, it's basically stop the world uh, checkpoints, but because it's single threaded and because you can do this fork, it, there's very little overhead involved in, in doing this. You don't, the pause isn't, isn't very long. So that part is very clever, and that is unique to, to Redis. For other things, we talk, it's already, we already talked about the single threaded. It's a chain hash table. There's no secondary indexes. So again, I can only do lookups on the primary key, on, on the key. And there's no schema. There's no constraints preventing you from putting whatever data you want in. Yes? Do you know why they chose a chained hash table? Slash, like, how do you resize it? Uh, this question is, uh, why do they choose a chain hash table? I, I don't know. Uh, then how do you resize it? Uh, you don't. Uh, you basically say, um, you basically say, my, my, you know, you you would define, you would allocate the amount of memory you want at the, at the very beginning, and then if you run out, you know, you, I mean, I think you got to turn it off and turn it back on. But uh, now, for the periodic checkpoints, because I think it's just writing out the contents of, of memory, so it's literally writing out the data structures in memory. I don't know whether you can resize it. Uh, based on a checkpoint, or whether you get to replay the entire right ahead log to, to repopulate it. All right, so they have some notion of transactions, um, but the basically way it works is it's, it's client side transactions. Uh, I don't know how to do this in, in the command line. We, we could look it up because it's, it's not begin commit. Um, the when you call begin, they're equivalent to begin on the on the client side. Then any uh, any any operation you apply, then it just gets batched. And then when you go commit, then everything gets, gets sent over the wire to the database server. And again, because it's single threaded, then it just runs whatever commands you, you, you provide it all at once. And that's, that's their notion of, of transactions. So the problem, though, is they don't allow for a rollback. So if I send a batch of query, uh, you know, queries over to do updates, and I make a mistake like I showed before, and I update, say I update two, uh, two records, then I make a mistake, and the transaction gets aborted, it can't roll back the previous things that I already did. So it's not true at atomic transactions, at least in, in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the open source version. For the replication, they're doing asynchronous prim primary replica replication. Uh, 
So the master is just going to send the op log, the commands that came into the wire, do downstream replicas. Um, and the, the, you can configure it to allow the primary to wait until, until some quorum of the replicas uh, respond that they got the, the requests. Not that they actually apply them, that they just got the network messages. Um, by default, though, I, I don't think that's, that's turned on. So it's like eventually, eventually consistent. Again, for a cache, that's probably OK. For primary database or primary storage, probably a bad idea. OK? So one thing I hope, I hope you get out of this, you know, these, going over these systems very quickly is that there's a bunch of these buzzwords I'm using that we've covered throughout the semester. And so you see now how you can look at any, any system and apply the concepts and methods and things we talked about throughout the entire semester and say, OK, now I understand what this system is actually doing when they say they're this or they're doing that. And what are the pros and cons of all of them? All right, so the next one that was voted the most was CockroachDB. Um, so CockroachDB came out in 2015. Um, it was it, less so recently, but initially when it first came out, it was sort of incorrectly described as the open source version of Google Spanner because the co-founders worked at Google uh, before they started CockroachDB. But they didn't work on Spanner. Um, they just said, let's go build a distributed database system. So it's a distributed relational database system that, that's written in Go. Um, and it's going to be a decentralized, homo homogeneous, shared nothing architecture that's going to use RAIN partitioning to split the database across different nodes. Uh, so it's going to be, they, they claim to be Postgres compatible, but for the SQL dialect and for the wire, wire protocol and the catalog, meaning like in theory, if I have my application written for Postgres using Postgres, you know, SQL syntax and so forth, and Postgres, you know, uh, client drivers, I can just point it at Cockroach and everything will work. Not entirely true. Some things w w will be different. Semantics of certain things will be different because Cockroach DB is distributed. Um, and certainly if there's new features that come out in, in, in Postgres that, you know, that just came out, Cockroach probably wouldn't support that. So we haven't really talked about licensing models uh, this semester, but it's interesting to point out that uh, Cockroach DB is open source, but they use what is called the BSL, the Business Source License. Um, and this is... This is sort of a, a trend that lasts five, six, seven, eight years in databases in particular, probably in, in other open source projects, but definitely in databases where it is open source. But the idea is that uh, if you're just like, you know, research, researcher like us or just like, you know, building a hobby project or just want to use it for your, you know, for whatever your application is, you can just download the software and you can just use it. The BSL, so it's open source, but it prevents you from being a cloud vendor and taking their software and then selling it as a service, like an Amazon, like a Google, like a Microsoft. Um, and there's a bunch of systems that have changed their, their licensing model to switch to something like the BSL. Mongo has some, something similar. Uh, Elastic switches something similar. And again, basically, there's a bunch of these open source projects where Amazon was making more money selling their, 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 their database system than, than the actual people building the database system. Uh, and so they switch to this, 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 this licensing model to pre prevent that. It has been challenged in, challenged in court, uh, but there's been enough. Um, it's enough to scare away some cloud vendors from doing certain things. Mongo has had dust-ups with Amazon. Elasticsearch had dust-ups with Amazon. Uh, so Amazon forked it, and I think it's called Open Search now. Right? There's, everyone's trying to avoid getting taken over, eaten alive by, by the cloud vendors. So... CockroachDB, on every single node, even though it's distributed, it's going to be log structured storage. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, the query engine is going to be a pool-based vectorized, uh, use a pool-based vectorized processing model. So even though it was originally designed for OLTP, they switched to a vectorized model a few years ago because they want to support also analytics on the system. And they're going to do MVCC, OCC. Um, and what's interesting is that all the transactions, even distributed transactions, will run with a serializable isolation level. Like if you call, like I want to run read, read and committed or read committed, that's just an alias for uh, for serializable. They they don't run anything uh, anything lower than that, which is really interesting. So the way to think about cockroaches architecture, it's it's the multi layer stuff that we've been seeing before, but at its core, it's just a replicated key value store, and that there's this infrastructure on top of the database system or on top of that key value store that understands SQL, understands partitioning schemes, understands you know, transactions and so forth. And so they're basically, you can think of the, 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 the storage layer, it's just a giant sorted map uh, in the key value store. And then the, 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 the upper layers are trying to figure out, okay, for this query, you need data from here and go update here and so forth, right? So when CockroachDB first came out, they, they, they were using RocksDB, 
which is Facebook's, Facebook's uh, log structured key value store, like the, the, the single node embedded database system. Um, and then I remember they were telling me a few years ago when I went to go visit them that the overhead of going from Go into C++ and for RocksDB was, was, the overhead was quite high. So a few years ago, they threw RocksDB away and they wrote their own uh, clone of RocksDB in Go called Pebble. Um, and you know, that way, sort of the, the whole stack is now entirely written in Go. Um, and that's the, that's the logo for Pebble that I made because they didn't have one, so I sent it to them because uh, I had to put something. Um, anyway, uh, and to do transactions, they're not going to use two-phase commit. They're not going to use uh, Paxos. They're going to use Raft, which, again, is just a variant of, of, of Paxos that we talked about last time. So the way they're going to order transactions is interesting. So they're going to use what, what are called hybrid clocks, which I think we talked about a little bit uh, earlier in the semester, where... Because now it's, they want to run transactions that, across nodes that could be in different locations around the world in, in the data center, you can't guarantee that their times are all going to be tightly synchronized. And so the, the transactions are going to get timestamps using a combination of the wall clock time that you get from the server you're running on, uh, and then an, a logical counter, and like a host ID to, to break ties. Um, and that's enough to globally... Uh, to make every transaction globally unique, and also to determine the order in which transactions should should commit. So the local clocks will still be synchronized using NTP, but it's not going to be super precise. Like when we talked about Spanner, they were using GPS uh, satellite receivers and atomic clocks, and that guaranteed their their, their times would be within some bounds of being of a, uh, synchronized across the world. But in this in in CockroachDB, since they, they can't run that proprietary hardware. They rely on the wall clocks being loosely synchronized, and, and, and that's just good enough for them to, to, you know, to, to at least coordinate without, uh, without ma massive delays. Of course, now, if you have some node where like, the clock's way off by like, an hour, then every transaction is going to fail because that, you know, those transactions are going to be uh, you know, way back in the past, uh, and that will break things, and therefore you have to you know, manually intervene to kill that node, but that's, that's beside the point. So for OCC, the way they're going to do it is the transaction is going to stage all the writes as intents, and then when they go commit, then they go. That's when they go check to see whether uh, you pass the validation phase. You're allowed to store stuff, and then all the metadata about where the transaction transaction state and the uh, the partitioning scheme or the catalog of the database itself. That's just also stored as as a table in the key value store, and that's you know replicated and, and you do transactions on top of that. So here's a basic overview of how a transaction would work. Uh, again, so you have some kind of catalog that keeps track of, of the partitioning scheme of the database. And in, I think by default, in, in CockroachDB, everything's always range partitioned. And so this state catalog, we replicate it across all the nodes. So if I want to do an update, uh, say a simple, simple case where I'm updating on the primary key, I go check the catalog to say, where, uh, you know, where, where can I find this partition? Uh, and then I'll figure out which one is the leader and you just run leader election for that partition whenever, whenever you, know, you need to, to determine who's the leader. And then all the writes will go to this node, the leader, and then it's responsible for then propagating the updates to the other partitions or other nodes that have the, the replicate, replicated copies of that partition using raft, and then get everyone to agree that this, this, this change is allowed to happen, and then you go ahead and commit. When you do an up, or sorry, when you do a read, uh, by default, you would always want to go read from the leader. Because, again, they, they only run with serializable isolation levels, so you can't do, by default, stale reads. So you can guarantee, by if you always go to the leader, that you always see the latest version of any object that you're looking for. Right? So you'll be directed to go do reads here. And obviously, when we talked about primary replica replication versus like multi-home, this was, uh, if all your writes are going to the leader and all your reads are going to the leader, the leader can become uh, a bottleneck and sl slow things down. So... I don't think they, they don't let you set the isolation level to, to go read from other nodes. You actually have to modify the SQL syntax to introduce the, uh, or give a hint to the database system that you're okay with reading stale data on the replicas. So in this case here, you change the, the, the select query to say, select from table XXX as of system time within the max stale, staleness of 10 seconds. So this then allows the database to decide, okay, if this node is at least 10 seconds in sync with the leader, I can then read any data from that. So although CockroachDB is open source, I think for this feature, it's only available in like the enterprise commercial version. 
right? So again, CockroachDB, decentralized, homogeneous, uh, share nothing distributed database system that's using RAF uh, to do transactions across different nodes, and they're doing multi-versioning uh, on top of that. All right, next one, Snowflake. So if you take 721, we're going to spend a lot of time talk talking about Snowflake. Um, so it is one of the first cloud-native uh, OLAP database systems. Everything's written in C++. Um, it's, a, it's one of the first systems that did, did a shared disk architecture, uh, at least for the cloud. The query engine itself is going to be a push-based vectorized query processing engine. Um, and this is what actually made Snowflake different than a bunch of other systems that, that sort of were trying to do analytics at, this, at that time. Um, in fact, they leveraged it very heavily on using SIMD or vectorized instructions on the CPU to process things in, in parallel within, within operators. To avoid the overhead of trying to interpret bytes or the, the, the types of, of, of columns and data at runtime and in having a bunch of indirection in the code, like a giant switch statement that says, you know, if I'm adding two numbers together or two, two values together, if it's integer, do this, if it's a float, do that. They want to avoid all that indirection because it's not great for modern CPUs. So what they do is they, they pre-compile all these low-level primitive operations for different data types, right? So if I want to add two, two types together, or it's actually, I, I want to check maybe whether a value is greater than another value. So I would have different copies of that same function, but one for floats, one for integers, one for strings, one for dates, and so forth. And you pre-compile them uh, when, you know, when you're actually building, making the build for the system. And then at runtime, you go figure out, because you have a catalog, you can look in, look in the schema and say, oh, I know I'm going to be operating on a column of this type. Let me go pick the primitive out that knows how to operate on 32-bit integers or 64-bit integers and so forth. Yes? The question is, would this be implemented as C++ templating? Yes. In BusTub, we don't do that. In BusTub, if you look, look at the, the value code for the value types, this is a, this is a switch statement. And that's how most systems do this. Postgres does this. MySQL does A lot of systems do this. Um, but again, if, if I'm, I'm going to read a billion tuples and the type's always going to be the same, I don't want to do that switch statement over and over again. It's, it's a waste. But if you have, if you have the same, um, you're going to be writing like the same code, right? If you have a switch statement, you have all these different versions of the function anyway. Like, does it save you much to do over the switch statement over templating? His question is, does it save you much to do? Does it save you much to do over templating over over uh, switch statement? I mean, I mean, but, but but like, think of like, it, it's more like the dispatch code. It's, it's like, so you give it to the switch statement, and you literally say, here's the pointer to the function that does 32-bit integer comparisons. Then at runtime, you, when you when you generate the query plan, you literally put in the point. You you, know, you call that that pointer instead of calling the function that has a switch statement that then calls that for you. It's like, so, it's like a software engineering thing. So you save much time doing a switch statement, is what I meant, if you're writing all the same things in the same thing anyway. Uh, do you save much time, sorry, what? Using switch statements instead of templating. You, no, you want, you want to get rid of the switch statement, yes. I guess I'm asking, why, do you, why would you not do this? Because there's a so software engineering overhead. You have to design your system for this, to do this. Okay. And prior to, there was another system before Snowflake, the, the co-founder of Snowflake, but another system called Vectorwise, which was a fork of ODB. Um, which is one of the early common storage systems. Like, prior to them, the, 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 the vectorized people, I think, innovated on this. Like, nobody did it this way. Just because they didn't. I don't know. Right? The, alternative, the alternative is also, pre, like, you do code generation. Like, what single store was talking about. Like, they, they, you take the query plan, they generate the op codes, and they compile that to machine code for every single query. The alternative is, is to do that. But like, IBM did that in the 70s and then abandoned it because it was a software engineering you know, overhead. Also, too, column stores weren't really a thing until the 2000s. So it didn't really make sense. Like, for doing O2P stuff, like in a bus tub, Postgres MySQL system, you're going to grab one row. This, it won't make a difference. But now if you're doing OLAP where you're just ripping through a column of a billion tuples, that switch statement becomes a big bottleneck. All right, so they're going to separate the table data from the metadata, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but there is no buffer pool at every single node. Uh, there is a cache, but it's not what we what we think of a traditional buffer pool. And then the 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 uh, the, the internal storage format for Snowflake Snowflake is basically packs that we talked about before. But they do support reading data from Parquet, CSVs, and all, all other data types you would have. All right. So the architecture itself is. Let's take a time to go through this real quickly. Um, 
but it, it's it's disaggregated storage. So you have the compute nodes, and then you have the the storage, and then all the storage is just the the, the cloud object store stuff we talked about before. So we talked about before, before about like I said, you don't want to use the OS for anything, but when it comes to the cloud databases, maybe you want to use Amazon's S3 or uh, Azure Storage, and aren't we giving things up? So in in the in the in the research papers about Snowflake, they talk about how it made their life so much easier just to offload all that store stuff to Amazon, and just worry about making a really fast fast engine. So and it allows, gives you the flexibility of scaling out compute separately from from the uh, from the, from the storage. So for the sake of time, I want to skip all of this. Um, I think we all already talked about this. But let me talk about one thing they do do that is, is actually interesting. So say a query shows up that wants to scan a lot of data, right? And say we're doing a simple join here and you know, with the build side and the probe side. Um, but let's say that this side of the, of the query is doing a massive scan on you know, maybe petabytes of data. And if I have... Um, if I have a fixed number of machines or workers to, to process this query, you know, this will become a bottleneck uh, for you. So what they have the ability to do is while the query is running, they can identify that, okay, I have to, you know, th this side is taking too long. So they can dynamically rewrite the query, the query plan, to split it up into uh, to, to separate operations. And in this case here, you can, you can basically add more nodes they start doing the, the, the table scan you need, and they're going to write it out to a bunch of temp files, and then you, you load it back in on, the, on the, the, the regular worker nodes to then do a union all, and then you produce the, the correct answer. So like while the query is running, they can add more nodes uh, to scale things out dynamically. And you as the, end, you as the user uh, or the customer, you don't know. right? And then the, the intermediate results are just getting written back to S3 so for them, that that's cheap and, and fast, fast enough. Yes. Is this different from like a materialized view? This question is this different from a materialized view? So materialized view would be like I compute the answer once, and then uh, other queries can then reuse that result. And then if if the table gets updated or anything gets updated, then it gets it automatically gets updated. Oh, this, the, only for just a query. This, this is just for a single query. Yes. And also too, like it it, it can't it. I don't think this thing supports uh, incremental updates like deltas and things like that. Is this done like is this done like based off like a cost estimation or like based off like dynamic runtime kind of statistics when they insert these changes? His question is how do they figure this out? Is this done um, while it's running or is it done uh, before it starts running? Actually, I, I think I, I misspoke. It's done at query optimization time. So they look at it. They know how much data you're going to read. They know that. Uh, it's just that this is going to be a bottleneck, and therefore they can they can give you more resources ahead of time. Okay, so it's like an estimation thing. It's like an estimation thing, yes. But what's interesting about it is that the the extra resources they're coming from, they're not like things you have to like pre-allocate. They have basically like a bullpen or like a spare worker pool. I think you can borrow nodes from other customers, and they because they, underneath the covers, this is all hidden from you. So like you can basically say say you pay for like I want five compute nodes. This query shows up, and they'll give you maybe a few extra just to finish the query, and you're borrowing them from somebody else. And that's, that's all hidden from you. Because otherwise, they, they, would, they would be idle. OK. Again, so Snowflake, again, it's a, it's a distributed, shared disk, vectorized, push-based uh, OLAP engine that runs entirely off of, uh, they originally started on S3, but they support other cloud platforms as well. And I remember, I think the Marcin, the, 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 the co-founder, like in the early days, people were asking, like, you know, you're crazy to be cloud native. You know, I want to run on prem, make make it run on prem, and they made the hard choice of deciding not to do that, even though some customers were offering them money, and in the end, it paid off. Right? And they went IPO, 2018, 2017. Um, they went IPO in five years. It's amazing. Okay, so this is the data system that was voted for the most, MangoDB. <laughs> All right, that's the best logo I could find. It's the only logo I find. All right, so. What is MangoDB? So MangoDB is a satirical implementation of MongoDB. Uh, it's written in Python. I can't run it because it only supports uh, an old version of Python and, and libraries. It only supports the, the MongoDB wire protocol up to version 2. Um, so the key idea of MangoDB is that all the data is written to dev null. Uh, and so the reason why what the joke is based on is that 
the original version of MongoDB, like this thing, like 2009, 2008, 2010, that they would put out these, these blog articles or these, these, these social media posts showing how, how much faster MongoDB was than every other database system. And part of the trick that, they were, that MongoDB was doing is that when you wrote to the database system, when you sent a write request to, to, to MongoDB, they would immediately come back with an acknowledgement and say, yep, we got it, right? And, that's, and that, that was the benchmark numbers they were reporting, like them versus MySQL versus Postgres, right? And the obvious reason why that's a bad idea, because it wasn't that, oh, you know, not that it even started running the queries, you just got the message on the server side. And there was no guarantee that that, message, that, that write request would actually get written to disk. If you wanted to know whether your write was actually written to disk, you then had to send another request and say, hey, that thing I just told you to write, did you actually write it? And it would block until it actually did it. So, this obviously meant that like, if you were doing a lot of writes in, 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 in your application and there was a crash, which of course every, every system is going to crash at some point, that there's no guarantee that the things you actually thought were written within some time window were actually made it to disk. There's other things that they did that in the early days too because they were using MMAP instead of a real buffer pool manager is that they had a single, uh, they had single database lock. So even though, again, going back to what you were saying before, like if you, know, if, if you, can't only, if you only have one writer or reader, is that really multi-threaded? So it was basically the same idea. They had a single exclusive lock on the data. So anytime you did an update, it would lock the whole the whole database system, right? Because they couldn't handle uh, doing multi-updates. The MAP stuff was a whole other whole other ball of wax. Um, so I normally don't don't like to show show you guys source code, but we can look at source code for MongoDB because this is it. <laughs> this is literally this this is the entire the, the, this is literally the entire database system. Um, so the first thing to point out here in this line here. They open up a, uh, a file descriptor to dev null. Fantastic, great, yes. Uh, then down in here, this is actually if a command shows up. So by is telling you to uh, by is telling you to, to, to you know, disconnect. Wait is waiting for uh, what is wait? Oh, a conditional lock up there, right? So this is actually a command actually doing something. So there's our single global lock entire data system. We require that. Then we write out whatever you sent over the wire to the data server to dev null. Fantastic, right? And then they have, uh, if, if you're in durable mode, they'll flush the, the output buffer <laughs> and then do an F sync on the, on the file descriptor, which is dev null, so it comes back immediately. Um, and then if you're running with eventual consistency mode, then no matter what you, what you send us, well, you send the server, you get back 42. Otherwise, you get a random value, right? And then you release the lock. So this is, you know, the joke is, again, is this good as MongoDB? Well, if you, if you care about your data, you, would, you obviously wouldn't want to use this, and you probably would, wouldn't want to use early versions of MongoDB. What's that? Web it's web scale. Uh, that video we cannot show because there's a lot of profanity there. Uh, we can post that later. Um, just, just Google MongoDB web scale. You'll, you'll see it. It's a cartoon. Um, so I'm not trying to pick on MongoDB, right? Uh, the... The, the sort of, how do I say this? The, the playbook, if you will, of what MongoDB did to get become successful has been done before, meaning put out a quote unquote inferior product that people like to use because it's easy and, and, and it's new and it's exciting, uh, get enough traction where that you can get enough money to then hire engineers to go pay off that, that technical debt of, of the mistakes you made. like. That MongoDB wasn't the first one that did that. That was what MySQL did in the 90s. MySQL, uh, the original D the storage engine was called MyISAM. That thing was total crap. They would lose data, couldn't handle transactions. It, you, it would corrupt the database all the time. And then InnoDB came along and, 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 and fixed all those things. And now you would not want to use MySAM. But before MySQL, this is what Oracle did. Oracle was a garbage system in the 70s and in the 80s. Uh, Ingress, the, the, you know, the, the version, the, the, the predecessor to Postgres, that was considered the, the, the better database system, but Oracle got better traction because they made a bunch of claims about what it could do that, that you know, in the future that it, eventually they got there. They got big enough where they could hire enough people to fix it. And now Oracle is a solid database system. So again, I'm not trying to pick on Mongo. This is, it's, you can think of like the, it's a marketing way to say like you sort of sell the, you don't sell the steak, you sell the sizzle. So you sell your database system, it's gonna solve all the world's problems. It's, it's state of the art, yada, yada, yada. And then, yeah, people get burned along the way, but whatever, right? Like, and then you get the money to fix things. Yes? Uh, say we're running on mission-critical hardware, then it's a good way to make these compromises. 
MangoDB? Okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you pointed, so I was like, wait a minute. For oh, oh, like if again, if it's it, his question is, is it okay to use like bleeding edge database software if it's for mission creative applications? If it's your bank account, hell no, right? Of course not, right? Um, so, but for some applications, sure, maybe, right? But I, I, I would say the default choice for any for any guys here that wants to do a startup, the default choice should be Postgres. Like, and then at some point, Postgres won't scale if, if, if your business grows and it's not enough. And then you hire somebody you know, to, to help you make it scalable, right? Or pick, pick one of these open source projects or, or these other newer systems that can do it, right? But uh, yeah, if it's mission critical, I, I, like, I would say also too, like all the things that the NoSQL guys say were a bad idea, SQL, obviously in the name, they didn't like transactions, they didn't like joins. All of them have added those things. And so the, the intellectual distance between a NoSQL system and a relational database system, it's, and at some point, it's going it's, it's to be, there, there is going to be no difference. So all the things they said were a bad idea, turns out, and then, and then like, and for me, it's like a you know, SQL maximalist or a purist, that I'm saying, oh, you don't want to be, you know, you don't want to be, you don't want to do, not do transactions, you don't want to not do SQL. Turns out they, they eventually came around and, and, uh, and added support for it. So the only NoSQL system that doesn't support SQL now is actually Redis. There's a, again, there's a, there's a clone for that, but again, it's, it's primarily being used for a cache. I, I know the MongoDB co-founder, uh, he's not there anymore, the, the CTO. He, 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 you know, he helped out in the early days when I was at CMU for, you know, with research funding. And I remember him telling me in the New York City office, like, oh, MongoDB will never support SQL. Never gonna happen. They added it two years ago, right? It's after he left, but like, still. So, um, don't write your data dev null. Uh, and I think, again, for mission critical data, I don't think shiny new things are a good idea. No, but uh, I meant if the hardware can support it. So suppose say Intel CPU supports a thing called advanced data recovery. So if there's a hardware cache that can recover the even like the L1 through L3 cache all the way to there. Like, yeah, so yeah, so Intel has this ADR stuff. I think it's also RAID as well, like like on the, writing to disk, right? Yeah. Um, if the hardware does it, is that going to be enough? Yeah. Well, I mean, well, no, because again, we, this is the whole semester we were talking about, like. Things got written to disk. But first of all, I, I don't. Can you? Can it bring back the program state exactly? The program counters? I don't think it can. I'm not sure. Right. So the problem there is like, if there's a bug in your software, and like it starts going down some code path that it shouldn't have, and starts writing data to your to your disk, the hardware thinks that's fine. The software is broken though. You got to recover from from that. And so if you can't if you can't guarantee strong and consistent transactions like, maybe across the nodes, then like that's gonna be a problem. So, you know, as much as I seem like a, like a, um, as a person that kind of has loose morals, and that's not the right word. Uh, <laughs> when it comes to databases, like, it, like I'm super cautious, right? Because you don't, it's, it, it's, it's the, it's like the operating system. It's like, if you, it's the core foundation of, 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 of a software system. And that kind of thing you don't want to mess around with. You, if you want to use JavaScript, put the application layer, that's fine. Put, put it all over there. Data system should be written in something more serious. Um, uh, that's going to be emails. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm sure one more fun system. This to me, this is the, I'm jealous because this is actually, wish, I wish I invented this system. This is, this is pure genius. Um, it's called tab DB. So it's a relational database system where they store the contents of your database in the titles of your tabs in your web browser. So the way the guy did this was he took SQLite C code, ran it through mscripten, which allows you to convert C code into to JavaScript. So now SQLite is running in JavaScript in your web browser, in your web page. And then when it wants to do writes, it splits up your, your, the database file and then, then writes it into tabs in your web browser. Uh, and you can run SQL, which is amazing. So, right here. Ah, sorry. Uh -huh. All right, so we got to make, uh, make it make some tabs, right? So we'll call it create statement, right? And then now you see the tabs have been renamed, and then now I can run a select statement, and I get results back. I don't know where, it, where the results end up. 
uh, but it ran, right? So if I add more tabs, I get more data. Oh, I had to do a bunch of inserts. That's why, that's why I got to do inserts, inserts. Oh. Yep. And I get my results back. And that's stored entirely in the tabs titles. Genius. I am very, very jealous of this. Um, I, I, I don't know what my joke database is. I, I got to think of one. Uh, but this, it's very hard to beat this. Yes? What happens if you click on a tab? If, if you click on a tab, I think you just get, yeah. But uh, you, uh, what if you delete a tab, right? <laughs> oh, still got it. Delete the first one? Yeah. Oh, you know what it is? It's, it's like the data is so small. Actually, yeah, I don't. It's still in memory. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, all right. That's a fun one, tab DB. Uh, we tried to get the guy to come give a talk with us, uh, and then I was going like, to try to promote it as like, a distinguished lecture in the, in the department um, <laughs> to say like, there's the groundbreaking idea, uh, but he was too busy. Um, all right, so quickly, 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 quickly. Uh, so, colluded remarks. Um, where does the name bus stop come from? So, uh, I have this, I read this blog article, and the best name of the name of data system is you pick two un random one syllable words, and you stick them together, and that makes your, makes your database name to be guaranteed unique for like, you know, search engines and stuff. Like Postgres, Postgres click house, uh, grid gain. Like you search those words, and it's guaranteed to be your data system. So, one of my PhD students, uh, he wrote a script where every morning on Slack would take two random words and, and put them together and post that on Slack. We, we, we would try to figure out which one we would want to use. So they were screwing me the first time because the first thing it spit out was poop dish. Um, <laughs> but then the very, next, the very next day, the real one they actually pointed, spit out was bus tub. And we just thought it was hilarious, so we did that. So we hired someone to, to draw a logo. So that's where it came from. Why is the relational model superior? I think I've already said this a couple of times, even today, but like the relational model is... It's, it's like the foundation for databases. Like, you know, no, one, no one's going to invent a new arithmetic, like 1 plus 1 equals 2. No one's going to reinvent that. The relational model can be used to model any possible type of application or, or, or data set, uh, whether it's arrays, lists, or um, uh, you know, JSON stuff. And although that goes against what the original idea of what Ted Codd had in the 1970s about what the relational model was, because he, he had no lists, he had no documents. But over time, the relational model has expanded to adapt to changes in how people program. Um, where I, today I, it can support everything. The next question you had was, uh, why do all the tech companies, why do tech companies support a lot of multiple data systems? This is money, right? Uh, pl plain and simple. Um, yeah, so. All right, so, uh, again, hopefully, hopefully through the last day of class, through that, you've been here with us for both of us entire semester, you now realize databases are awesome. They're super important. If there's still a lot of activity in this space. There's still a lot of money. We barely touched what all the different things you could actually do. We, like, I brought up in-memory databases today. That's the first time we really talked about it. That's a whole other category of databases uh, that are super fascinating. And there's embedded devices and, and large-scale systems. So a bunch of these things, like, there's, but the core ideas we talked about, even though we, we, we described it mostly in a single-node context, again, it's applicable everywhere. So again, hopefully going forward the rest of your, rest of your career, no matter whether you're actually building the internals of a data system or not, you'll understand what's actually going on when you run a query. And so when, the, the, when there'll be performance problems, at least now you can, you can understand what's, what's going on and decide is it something because we're using the data system wrong or it's because uh, the data system is just not implemented uh, correctly or good enough. And this is going to allow you to make better decisions throughout your life about what kind of system you should use. Goes back to the thing he was asking before. Why would anybody want to use one of these brand new databases? Or like, should you use them if uh, you know if it's a mission critical application? So now you can go look at the documentation, and understand what claims a data system is actually making, to to understand you know what are the things that could be a problem later on. Because the first five minutes, sure, yeah, the query, query might run fast. That's what MongoDB did. But like as things scale or as, as you do more more complex operations on it, you could have a bunch of problems. Okay. All right. So before we go. Uh, before we go, uh, we just got notice from the, the provost um, from the university that the voting is in, and DJ2PL has been voted the most dank course DJ oh. at all of Carnegie Mellon. So, yeah, right here, photo. 
<laughs> Nick, you grab this. It's yours. You go like this. You got it. Okay. Congratulations. All right, and again, uh, for those who came late, DJ Chupiel's agent sent over photos. Uh, so he's going to be signing autographs uh, right after class. Okay? All right. Good luck with the rest of your classes. Take care. Hit it. This shit is gangsta. Gangsta. That boy's a gangsta. Yeah, ain't nothing but gangsta. Yeah, yeah. Now listen, I'm the poppy with the motherfucking hookup. 28 a gram, depending on if it's cook up. You ain't hit a mob yet? Still got you shook up? I smack you with the bottom of the clip and tell you, look up. Show me where the safe's at before I blow your face back. I got a block on taps, the feds can't trace that. Style is like tamper proof, you can't lace that. The Dominican, or you could call me Dominican. Black skelly, black leather, black suede Timberlands. My all black 38 to send you to the purdy gates. You get consignment trying to skate, and that's your first mistake. <laughs> I ain't lying for that cake, your fam, I see you wake. My grams is heavyweight, then ran through every state. When they ask me how I'm living, I tell them I'm living great.